We will be talking about chapter five today in geology, and so I'll share my screen so that we can all see what's going on. So, uh, this chapter is involved with weathering, and um, weathering is how a rock gets broken down into smaller pieces, and there are a variety of different ways this can occur. Once a, a rock is weathered, it's broken down into those smaller pieces, it can form sediments that might, in soils, uh, the sediments can end up forming rocks, and in fact, we'll have a lab on sedimentary rocks formed from weathering byproducts. Erosion is when those bits of rock particles are picked up by some sort of agent. Well, what do we mean by an agent? We mean water or ice or wind. Those are our three agents of erosion. They're all three capable of picking up small bits of rock and moving it from one location to the other. And then finally, after it's picked up, the rock is materials, the weathering byproducts are transported. Now, most people link erosion and transportation together as sort of one event it is almost impossible to pick up a piece of loose material, <clears throat> excuse me, and not move it in some fashion. And so, but, but technically transportation is a separate issue. Um, all right, so how does weathering alter rocks? We've got two kinds of weathering, mechanical and chemical weathering, and we'll discuss both in some detail. So some of the effects of weathering, weathering can alter the shape of a rock. Um, you get all kinds of interesting shapes when this happens. This is an example of spheroidal weathering. So here you see these round boulders. They didn't start out rounded like that. They started out as a more jagged piece of rock and you can see that over time they keep getting more rounded, more softened a little bit until eventually you can maybe see the little crack right here in the photograph and another little crack right here. These rocks will actually separate from the larger rock and then over time become even more rounded in appearance. So that's one example. You can also have what's referred to as differential weathering. Differential weathering occurs when you've got two or more different kinds of rocks, and they break down at different rates. They weather at different rates. What you end up with are some beautiful rock formations with differential weathering. So let's look at a couple of them. This first photograph is from Bryce Canyon National Park, which is in Utah. It is a beautiful place. I have been there and just thoroughly loved it. Uh, lots of just gorgeous rock formations. These spires that come up are called locally hoodoos. Um, they look like they've been carved out, and they have, but it's by nature. So it's an example of differential weathering. The rock that's left behind was more resistant to weathering than the rock that got taken away. This is another example of differential weathering. This is a pedestal rock. This is a particular kind from Mushroom State Park, which is in Kansas. You can see that there's a rock on top and then there's a smaller piece underneath. So there's, this is, represents two different kinds of rocks. The one on top is more resistant to weathering than the one on the bottom. And the result is, that as the bottom rock gets eaten away, the top one stays in place. Eventually, the pedestal will become so small it cannot support the top part of the rock, and it will fall down. But until then, it's just a, a very interesting form of natural sculpture. So we also have mechanical weathering. Mechanical weathering um, produces all kinds of neat effects also, and you've seen some of this, you just maybe weren't aware of it. Lots of different things produce mechanical weathering, frost action, abrasion, pressure release, 
frost action doesn't mean just the frost you see on the grass. Frost action is about water seeping into the ground or into uh, cracks in rocks and changing when the temperatures drop. So let's look at that. Let's scroll up just a little bit. So water expands 9% in volume when it freezes. If you've ever stuck a water bottle in the freezer, you know water expands because the water bottle bulges out. Uh, or if you've ever made ice cubes the old fashioned way where you put the water in the tray and stick it in the freezer, you know oftentimes it comes up higher than you expect it to. So water will expand when it freezes. This is because of the hydrogen bonds, but that's another, another story. So it gets into the crag. So we've got a, this graphic shows us that we've got the gray rock and the blue water gets into the crack. It freezes and expands. And what that does is it enlarges the crack. And then over time, the rock will actually break apart. This is called frost wedging frost wedging, when the water gets into a pre-existing crack, expands the crack because of uh, expansion during freezing, and then the, the rock breaks. That's called frost wedging. The frozen water has wedged the crack open. There is a second type of frost action that's fairly common. It's called frost heaving, frost heaving, this water soaks down into the ground and it freezes and expands and what it will do is it pushes up anything that's on top of it so if you have the water down here and rocks above it when the water expands the rocks are going to come up this is the reason why in the spring uh, if you live in a place with a rocky soil and freezing winter conditions you are likely to find in your garden or in your flower beds, little tiny rocks that have been slowly pushed up over the course of a winter time. Frost heaving. I especially like this photograph. This is, you can see there's grass up here on the top and little bits of rock. This is maybe in a garden, maybe in a flower bed, I don't know. I just thought it was a really cool photo. You can see the ice in the soil. So what has happened is maybe it rained the day before, water soaked into the ground and it froze and then the ice ex would expand and push up and the rocks came to the surface with it. I've seen this a time or two, this attractive, mostly in flower beds because the um, soil is very, very loose and there wasn't anything covering up so it was easy to see and it's easy to move around. But you can see the rocks, all the little rocks that were brought up because of frost heaving. So the water in the soil can also form what are called ice lenses ice lenses like the lens in a, a pair of glasses so these discs of frozen water will push up and um, cause i don't know your sidewalk to buckle that kind of thing water can cause abrasion to rocks um, if a rock is in a stream, over time it's going to bump into things. Either the rock is going to move downstream or other rocks are going to move onto it. And during these collisions, friction is going to knock off little bits of the rock and cause this abrasion will cause the surfaces to be very, very smooth. The longer a rock stays in the water, the smoother the surface is going to be. So this is a photograph of some of the rocks in um, the river in Zion National Park. It's noted for these really large, these things can be a foot or more long, these really large rocks and they're all very nicely rounded. You can buy river rocks um, in the hardware store or the home improvement store, buy the bag to use in your landscaping projects. They probably really didn't come from the river. I would be willing to bet that most of them 
were rocks dumped into a cement mixer with some other things and turned enough times to, to soften the sharp edges. So this is abrasion that results in a rounded rock. Pressure release gives us other really neat formations. So there are some rocks that when they are under pressure stay solid, but when you stop pushing down on them, what will happen is they crack in certain directions because it's a natural direction of weakness. This really is called pressure release and it happens very frequently in granite. Granite is a rock known for this, which means when you dig granite out of the ground in a granite quarry, it is more than likely going to crack all by itself sooner or later into big sheets of granite. Um, they're usually parallel to the ground and these, these cracks are called sheet joints. Sometimes the granite is in a dome shape and instead of making these horizontal layers, what you end up with are layers more like an onion and the rock formations are referred to as exfoliation domes. Exfoliation domes. They are usually very large. An example of that would be Stone Mountain, Georgia. It's an exfoliation dome. Some of you maybe have seen it. Here is a photograph of an exfoliation dome and you can see the layers on top are have broken into some fairly large chunks and over time they're just going to fall off. There'll be a little lot of rock debris at the base of an exfoliation dome. Here's just another one. This one's in Texas. So there are other forms of mechanical weathering other forms of mechanical weathering, you can have plant growth. Uh, this is a photograph of a tree growing into a crack in a rock. If you have ever driven up into the mountains, you will see a lot of funny little bushes and trees growing out of the sides of the mountain. What will happen is acid in the, the rain will eat away at the rock and cause it to uh, become soft and a little crumbly in places and a seed of a tree will land on it at just the right time and begin to sprout. Little cracks are great receptacles for seeds and all kinds of things will grow in them. As the tree grows, it's going to enlarge the crack because the, the roots don't stay tiny forever. We also have examples of chemical weathering. We have examples of chemical weathering. So chemical weathering occurs when whatever substances are involved are, want to reach chemical equilibrium. You maybe have seen this if you tried to add sugar to iced tea. You can pour the sugar in and stir, 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 and some of it will dissolve, but normally cold tea will not dissolve as much sugar as most people want in it. I guess it's a Southern thing. If you don't drink sweet tea, you're, you're not as familiar. But um, the sugar will go into solution up to a certain point and then the cold liquid will not hold anymore. If you heat it, you can actually get more sugar to dissolve in it, which is why any good Southern cook puts their sugar in their sweet tea while it's still warm and will dissolve, not after it's cooled off. Uh, so chemical equilibrium is what's going on. We're trying to have the substances do that and changes usually take place. So the rate of chemical equilibrium depends on the surface area. If the rock you're looking at is big and flat, it's got a big surface for the reactions to take place. If that same rock only has this size area, you're not going to get as rapid a reaction because this, the surface area is significantly smaller. It also relates to the temperature. We've talked about that with the sugar in the tea, that certain chemical reactions take place better at 
warm temperatures than they do at cold temperatures. It also is impacted by the amount of water available. Water is a great facilitator for chemical reactions. So the most effective agent of chemical weathering is acid. Acid in the, the soil, acid in the water, acid in the air. Um, there's always a little moisture in air and sometimes that moisture is actually little drops of acid. But we'll, we'll look at some of the reactions. So some of the main ones are the role of oxygen. Oxygen plays a really pivotal role in uh, breaking down materials naturally. So with oxidation, the oxygen in the air will combine with the chemicals in the rock, for example, that we're talking about. And this will result in what we refer to as oxides. Pyrite, which is sometimes called fool's gold, and you saw it in the first lab on minerals, Pyrite has iron in it, and iron will rust. It'll form an oxide when exposed to air. If you're out and you're looking for pyrite and you see a little drizzle down the side of a rock and it looks like a little drizzle of rust, if you trace it back, you very well might find some pyrite crystals. So oxidation occurs usually when rocks are exposed at the surface. I don't know that this graphic shows up as well as I would like, but we'll still talk about it. This, this is a rock that's been, a side has been chipped off. In the very center, it is a whiter color, a, a sort of a, a tan gray color, but along the edges, you should be able to see this kind of a pink tinge to it. That pink tinge is because this rock has undergone oxidation. Um, it, it has broken, reacted with the oxygen in the air to form an, in essence, rust over time. Some of the samples we see in lab for our different rocks will look different on the top than they do on the bottom because the top gets exposed to more air than the bottom does. So the role of acids. Acids are particularly harmful to rocks. They're, they're probably the main agent of chemical weathering. So um, there are all kinds of chemicals in the air and in the water and the clouds. And when these chemicals form acids and the acids interact, some rocks are naturally less resistant to acids than other. Limestones and marbles are really easy for the acids to break down. Here is a photograph of a, a statue that's been outdoors. The one on the left was taken in 1908, and the one on the right was taken in 1968. So over 60 years, the statue has completely lost her face. The folds on her garments have just withered away to just, they've weathered away to nothing. Poor thing has no hand anymore. All of this is because of uh, chemical weathering. You can see it also in the facades on buildings and in cemeteries. If you go to a cemetery, you can always tell the older uh, markers from the young ones because of the amount of weathering. So there's also something called solution weathering. This usually involves uh, water, uh, particularly hydration. Water actually will dissolve some rocks. It just takes a long time. Um, quartz, which is a mineral, happens to dissolve fairly easily in water. It just does it very, very slowly. When the water then evaporates, what results is the sedimentary rock chert. Um, you don't get the quartz back, but you get it, it, it now is in a sedimentary rock and you'll see chert in the sedimentary rock slabs. Calcite also is, is uh, easy for water to dissolve in and you get limestone caves this way. A lot of caves are made out of limestone because it's really easy for the water and the acids in the water to eat away at the rock. This is a photograph 
showing solution weathering in Yorkshire, in the UK. And you can see the surface of the rock just has all these little crevices in it. So over time, water gets into these little cracks and just dissolves away at the rock. Felspar is a mineral. We saw some of it in our very first, uh, our lab on minerals. But what will happen, and a lot of rocks in this part of North Carolina have felspar in them. Felspar will react with carbonic acid and it actually ends up producing a new mineral, a clay mineral. Now, clay minerals are not exactly the same thing as the clay you and I think of, our clay soils. Um, so you can see that the mineral felspar, which looks like this, if it undergoes hydrolysis, it will weather and turn into kaolinite, which is a mineral that's a clay mineral. So it can look completely different. It'll be softer, um, it has different chemical properties, it just alters the structure, the, the uh, structure of the felspar is just completely altered. All right, let's move along. So there are other things where we have chemical weathering. Um, diamonds are brought to the surface of the earth in what are referred to as kimberlite pipes. These are columns. So diamonds are formed deep underground. It takes a tremendous amount of heat and pressure to form a diamond. So if you find it on the surface, it's not where it started out. So the, if the diamond starts out deep underground, how does it get to the surface? Well, the heat will melt and crack rock and a volcano will bring up this rock to the surface and along with it, you have diamonds. And then oftentimes what will happen is those diamonds will be carried away because of water action. So typically if you find a diamond, you start tracing it back to its point of origin if you want to look for more of them. Uh, this used to be fairly common. It's not so much anymore now. They usually dig for diamonds, so they're diamond mines. Um, kimberlite is an igneous rock and it's known for containing diamonds. It's named after a town in South Africa. Um, there is a large open pit mine there, which is now called the Big Hole. I honestly don't know if they, I don't believe they still do active mining in it because it's full of water, but certainly there are lots of diamond mines in Africa. Um, so diamonds form underground and have to be brought up to the surface. And it can happen naturally or it can happen in a diamond mine and you go down and dig it up. All right, moving along to weathering products. So rocks undergo weathering and become part of the soil. What I call soil, you would probably call dirt, but that's okay. Um, we'll look at some of these products. So fell, if it, your rock starts out with felspar in it, you're gonna find clay minerals once they undergo weathering. If they're ferromagnesian minerals, those were the, a lot of the ones from our first lab, they'll end up as clay minerals also. Muscovite, remember that was uh, a form of mica that flaked off into thin flat sheets that will also form a clay mineral. Quartz usually gets broken down into little tiny bits and forms sand. And calcite almost always is dissolved. And so you, you don't usually see it weathering to a solid particle. You see it uh, being dissolved and carried away. So soil formation, let's look at that. Uh, soil is the loose, unconsolidated material on the top of the bedrock, and it has three components to it. It ha it's made up of organic material, so leaves that fall off the trees or a dead branch or even a poor squirrel that lived out his life in the forest and then killed over dead uh, when he is 
organic material breaks down, it becomes part of the soil. Um, so inorganic material, well, that's just little bits of rock. And then the third component is almost always water. So soil contains organic material, inorganic material, and water. The proportions will vary from place to place, but it needs to contain all three. Um, the real differentiating factor between soil and dirt is that soil can support plant life. And you and I have seen pictures of things growing in the desert, so we know it doesn't take a lot of water for every single plant to grow. The soils will vary from location to location depending on the bedrock available, the water available, and the plant and animal life. I always like to give an example of my yard. Um, we have a wooded area not far, and the soil in the wooded area doesn't look anything like the soil my grass is growing on. So in the wooded area, you get a lot more organic material. And in the area where the grass is, it only gets organic material when I cut the grass and the grass clippings stay and act as natural fertilizer for the soil. So differences from one spot to another just in a yard are a result of probably differences in organic material. Um, but from one area of the state to another area of the state, it might be because of differences in bedrock. Um, the inorganic portion of the soil is often broken down into sand, silt, and clay. And this little graphic, I'll scroll it up, I hope, so you can see. This little graphic helps you with the relative sizes of sand, silt, and clay. So the big circle represents the sand. Sand is actually the big chunky part of soil. If you get small, you are in that you're at the silt stage of things. And then little teeny tiny is the clay. And around this part of North Carolina and certainly other areas in the region, clay soil is fairly common. So clay um, is very small. It's also very flat. It's, I always like to describe it as a lot like a, a paper plate. And so it stacks really well, which makes it very difficult for water to permeate through it. Um, sand, on the other hand, is big and chunky and irregular, and water can normally percolate through sand fairly easily. So if you're planting a garden, sometimes you have to amend your soil. If your soil is super sandy, you might have to add some organic material to it. If your soil is just mostly clay, you might have to add some sand to it to get it to uh, break up and percolate a little better. Insects, like in the form of ants and worms, uh, work to naturally aerate the soil. They'll wiggle down in and create pathways for water and gases to get down into the soil so a plant's roots can take them up. So ants are good, just not in my kitchen. So as I said, sand will keep the soil loose so the water can percolate down and, and actually clay does serve a purpose. It holds moisture in the soil. I know this graphic is really small and you probably can't see it very well. It's just showing you that the percentage of clay and sand and silt in a soil gives it a different composition and different characteristics. And depending on these percentages, your soil will fall on different parts of our soil triangle. So you can see all silt, all clay, all sand. You can see sandy clay, silty clay, and, and other combinations. If you were a farmer, this would be really important. Alrighty, so soil is broken up into several horizontal layers that are called soil horizons. The top layer is the O horizon, and it has the organic matter in it. So a leaf falls off the tree, it becomes part of the O horizon. Right below that is the organic matter mixed with the mineral matter, and that's the A horizon. 
If you go below that, you have the E horizon. That's where leaching uh, tends to deposit minerals. So leaching is when water will take chemicals from one location and move it to another. Um, it'll bring the chemicals slowly down and sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes it, it forms a layer called hard pan and we'll talk about that in a minute. You can have the B horizon, the C, you can have lots of different horizons. So the very top one is the organic for the O horizon and the very bottom one is the R horizon where you find your bedrock, your base minerals that, that the soil is made out of. This maybe is a little prettier graphic. It shows you some of it. So the O horizon, they call it the litter layer. Again, that's where the leaves and the broken off branches end up. The A is the topsoil. E is again leaching. So water brings minerals down to this layer. You have the subsoil below that. Uh, the C horizon, it says are weathered parent material. That means it's little bits of rock that haven't yet incorporated with organic material to form soil. And then the very bottom is the R horizon, which is the bedrock. If you've ever seen where they uh, dug down into the ground, maybe to make a basement on a building or some other structure, you may have noticed the different colors in the soil as you go down. So you can see this one, the top is darker. And as you get down, there's sort of a, a yellowy tinge to it. And then at the bottom, it's almost white in color. Um, so different materials give it different colors. Soil is broken up into 12 large groups that we call orders, and every order has been is broken up into suborders. And there's a whole science called soil science, and we certainly don't have time for it. I did want you to see some of these 12 orders. Mostly, I wanted you to appreciate that the soil, this is from the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, I wanted you to appreciate that the soils have different colors. So this one is a really light gray. This is kind of an orange yellow. This one has a, uh, a black tinge to it. Again, as you move across, this one's orangey, very black, very yellowish orange. So different colors for the soil. So we talk about residual soils and transported soils. Residual soils are made from the rock that's directly below it. So if you dig down, you'll find the chemicals in the rock in the R horizon are gonna be the chemicals you'll find in the soil up above it. Transported soil, however, is brought in from a different location. This can happen because of man, maybe you moved it in to fill in something. It can happen because of a natural phenomenon. Maybe there's flooding and a river just drags lots of material downstream. And in fact, that happens. Um, the Nile River in Egypt was noted for seasonal flooding and it would bring large amounts of topsoil from upstream to downstream. And once the floodwaters receded, the farmers used that new soil to plant crops in. And it was wonderful because they didn't have to worry about fertilizing it or nature did it for them. So transported soil can be nice. The central portion of the northern part of the US has transported soil in it. The last ice age brought uh, soil down from Canada and that's one of the reasons why that part of the United States can grow wheat and corn and, and other crops like that. So glaciers tend to bring soil into an area, but volcanoes can move it, ice can do it, can do it, wind can do it. I didn't write down water, but certainly it can. I mean, like I said, the Nile is a prime example of that. Um, hard pan, I want to mention it just briefly. 
So hard pan is a layer in a swill horizon. If you're digging and you hit a layer and it's just really almost impossible to get your shovel through it and it doesn't turn out to be just an isolated rock, you may have hit an area of a hard pan. So hard pan happens when chemicals are brought down, they're leached down into the soil and go lower, but the, they end up being silicas and irons and they solidify, they, they form a solid. And what this does is it prevents water and roots from penetrating. So in this graphic, the plant on the la left is in soil that doesn't have hard pan. And the one on the right, we have this little thin layer and the roots can't get past it. Um, here is another example. I forgot to do spell check. I'm sorry about that. So in this photograph, this thin white line is the layer of hard pan. Hard pan is also called caliche and it's called calcrete in some places. It's a, a naturally occurring, it's almost a concrete-like surface, but naturally occurring. Another thing in soils are laterites. They're composed almost entirely of iron and aluminum oxides. So the iron tends to give it an orangey look, and they also tend to form um, like little round balls. So it's, it's a very odd looking soil. They form in tropical regions that have high temperatures and lots of rain. Bauxite, which we saw in our very first lab on minerals, uh, forms in laterites a lot of times, which is one of the reasons why in the bauxite you found those little round P-shaped inclusions. Remember, bauxite's an ore for aluminum. All right, you can also have paleo soils. So a paleo soil is an ancient soil. It's, it's old dirt. And typically you'll have it in place and then something's going to come to bury it and it traps the soil in position. So maybe you were farming when Pompeii, when Mount Vesuvius erupted and now your farm is covered in volcanic ash. Your farm soil is now paleo soil and if you leave it alone and move someplace else and farm there, over time if a geologist comes and digs down, he's going to find a history of the area. So paleo soils can give scientists information about climate, about the, the shape of the landscape, that would be the topography, and uh, something about the ages of any organic material trapped in it. So if your corn crop got trapped by the ash in the volcano, we could tell something about the corn. This is a photograph of the state soil for North Carolina. Every state has a state soil. I just thought it was funny. Um, Ours is named Cecil. Oh, when I was a child, there was a cartoon, Cecil the sea, sea Serpent. That's not for Cecil, that Cecil, I'm sure it's somebody's last name. But you can see it's orange. It looks like the orange clay we find in this part of North Carolina. And I think that stops us, so the end.